Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope, and today we're giving you a how to play video of Lions of Lydia. This was made by Bellwether Games and designed by Johnny Pack. Yeah, it has Pretty popular some other there. titles in his in his history, oh, specifically yeah, Sierra Rest. Yeah, one or two. A few good titles. <laughs> this is a really interesting game. Mm -hmm. Now, like any of our how to play videos, we sort of have a conversational structure that we go through, and we'll do our best to have some links down below to help you get to specific points. But we're gonna start off with the overview, mm -hmm. the theme, going to the components, everything you see here on the table, including the setup of this game. Pretty simple, mm -hmm. not too complicated. And then get into the actual gameplay itself yeah. with a few examples here on the board as if we were kind of going through a round. Mm -hmm. So that by the end of this video, while we'll laugh and joke and jump back and forth, you should know how to table and play this game needing only to reference maybe the specific setup guide in the booklet itself. Or, or maybe this video again. Or this video again, or keywords when it comes to endgame scoring mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. So, Lions of Lydia, Jan. Ah, <sighs> do I have the honors? Well, first set up the game, then read the flavor text. Oh, Unless fine. you want to read flavor text immediately, you're welcome to. Well, I, I am a massive I'm getting fan. used to the flavor text thing, so. Ah, yeah, well, go ahead and get it then. Okay, like, yay! I'm a big fan of flavor text. I'm not going to say no to you reading some flavor text. Well, did you know that the ancient world is changing? I've heard that. King Croesus of the historic kingdom of Lydia has minted the world's first coin from the legendary gold and silver of the river Pactolus. Traditional bartering and trading will soon be supplanted by currency as the dominant form of exchange throughout civilization. Lions of Lydia is a bag management and engine building game about the dawn of currency in the ancient world. As a wealthy aristocrat at the turn of the era, you will hire merchants to barter the city gates for goods you can use to increase your land holdings. When Lydian merchants arrive from the capital, you will gain access to the versatile Lydian lion coins they bear, which are needed to establish valuable retail property for the first time in history. To achieve victory, you must effectively manage the merchants you hire, keeping the best assortment in your bag, while leveraging the unique abilities of each when it is drawn. Traditional merchants will help you specialize in basic resources, but if you fail to convert your surplus into bullion, you may not be able to buy the most useful properties in the city. Lydian merchants, in contrast, are especially suited to help you transition to the new monetary system. Will you be able to maintain the right balance of merchants to maximize your goals every turn? Will you gain the most valuable and prestigious properties before your rivals? Future generations may hear of your economic triumph or defeat. After a significant number of properties have been purchased and developed, the game will end and a winner will be declared. So that's the theme, that's the setup. And I have to be honest, this is one of those games, because of the way I learn games, I'm a thematic learner, right? Mm -hmm. I attach everything to the narrative in my brain and then move forward from there. That theme is reinforced by the gameplay. Yeah, it's it, it was like the last link we needed in order to tie everything tie, together in a really, really nice and concise way. It closes everything together. It lets you understand why you're going to these gates, why you're going to the fountain, why you're trading for coin, gathering cards, gaining victory points. Mm -hmm. I like it. It seals the deal. And you'll see that as we go through this video. That being said, this game is a bag management, yep. resource collection, mm -hmm. worker allocation, Mm -hmm. Style game, I mean, it's not worker placement. And most of all, engine building. You're working on gaining these properties that mm -hmm. give you bonus actions when you go to different locations here on the main board. Uh, as far as the game state, I think it's suggested for 13 plus, plays mm -hmm. two to four, and averages about 30 to 60 minutes. Yeah, it's a pretty quick one. In our playtesting, we've found that to be accurate pretty across accurate, yeah. the board. I mm -hmm. don't know that 13 plus, I think you could probably play it with some younger player counts. Definitely. Um, it is not an aggressively heavy game. Mm -hmm. However, it does have some rewarding chaining and strategy to play. Yeah. Uh, I like the bag mechanism. Yeah, it's Quite nice. A bit. It's neat, it feels good. So, so with all that being said, let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive into this. And mm -hmm. before we get into the setup, let's go ahead and acknowledge all the B-roll, everything people are seeing. This is a prototype copy from Bellwether Games. Even though it doesn't look it, no, this is a very nice yeah. prototype copy from mm -hmm. Bellwether Games. That being said, swing over to their main page or onto the Kickstarter link if this is live, mm -hmm. kind of while you're checking, to get a look at what the official kind of published copy of this game is going to look like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everything here, really nice, still prototype. Definitely. So first off, you're going to have a player board, and that player board is going to have 
four main resource tokens that you're going to use to kind of track how your society is gaining these different elements to try and you know build everything up. Color and symbol coded, mm -hmm. very easy. You're just gonna place each one of those resource markers there on your player board. Yep. And then here at the bottom, you have another track, but this is a track of evolution of influence. So mm -hmm. basically, during different instances in the game, you'll be able to move this gray token all the way up, which you're gonna be able to get different Scores things Scores you some additional resources, mm -hmm. makes it so you can actually have more cards, and does give you end game victory points uh, for kind of win condition. Yeah. The last thing we have here next mm -hmm. to our player board is going to be a individual card. So yep. for instance, I have the blue player board here. You can see that by the bottom symbol. And I have yellow. So we've taken the property card or the gate card associated with our color. Yep. And essentially what that's going to do is that it's gonna give us a little bit more of efficiency when going to that color starting off the game. Yep. And then going now here to the center to the center of the table, we have our game board. The game board is divided into five areas. Yep. Um, you have four different colored areas. These are called gates. And then finally the fountain in the center. Yep. Every turn, essentially, a player is going to take a meeple and place it on one of these five areas and be able to do something specific to that place. When setting up, all you're going to do is essentially place the colored gate and then a meeple that is not that color on that space. Yeah, so there's going to be one of each color meeple out on these four outside gates, mm -hmm. not coordinated with Correct. the gate color. And then in the center here, this fountain location, which will give you some more actions if you place a meeple there. Mm -hmm. You're gonna place one of each type of meeple in that location, yeah. so a green, yellow, red, and blue. And then on the periphery of that game board, you're going to have your property cards. Yep. All the cards in this game are called property cards. You have three different types. You have gray property cards, gold property cards, and finally purple property cards. Each of them are going to do different things. So your gray cards are not as efficient as your gold cards are going to be. Gold cards tend to take advantage of the new Lydian traders that are gonna come in. And finally your purple cards, they're just gonna be for victory point conditions, which can become very profitable by the end of the game. Yeah, so the way you're gonna set out this board here, you're gonna start with two purple on mm -hmm. each location. You're then gonna have one gold on each location. And every gold gets a Lydian trader as well. Every gold is gonna get one of these little golden meeples, mm -hmm. just like we have on our player board here mm -hmm. with the indicated symbol at the first kind of advancement location. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have a different amount of gray cards based on current player count. Yep. So we have our board set up for a two player game. Yep. Uh, so there's two of each of those gray. For a three and four, I believe it's three of each of the gray yes. on each side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you'll build it out just like this so you have a map that you can reference. Now, these sides are going to be important. Yes. In the actual gameplay, you are restricted to buying as many properties mm -hmm. as you would like from one individual, one specific side. Yep. So how you build this out does really matter. Mm -hmm. The last few things you're gonna do, you're gonna set your coins over to the other side. They'll be used for resources and things throughout the course of the game, potentially victory points, yeah. depending on how you play. And then lastly, each person's bag is going to have one of each type of meeple, mm -hmm. a green, red, yellow, and blue, right from the start. Every turn, we'll get into this in the specifics, but every turn you will only ever have four meeples in your bag. You're always drawing, placing, resolving, and then refilling. Yep. So that's the setup. Not too complicated, Not fairly easy to uh, to kind of get the flow. The biggest mm -hmm. thing is just making sure you get your cards laid out here. Yep. Uh, and don't forget your golden meeple buddies mm -hmm. on each of your golden cards. Oh, and the last thing that we talk about is actually this fountain marker. This gets yep. there right at the end of the setup. So make sure that you always place this out there. And this will be for end game scoring. The mm -hmm. first to accomplish uh, kind of advancement over here mm -hmm. will gain that as a reward. They get to count their coins as actual victory points. Yeah, so I think that actually is a good segue into talking about how the game works and yep. then we can go into how you win the game, which is through the card mechanism. So let's start with the general flow of the game, mm -hmm. and then let's get into specifics with the fountain and each one of these gates specifically. Yep. The game's gonna be structured around three core phases. Mm -hmm. You're gonna start with a bag draw phase. Yep. That's where the active player is gonna reach into their bag, mm -hmm. draw one meeple out, and then move on to the second phase. The second phase is essentially going to consist of placing that maple somewhere on the game board. So like we said, the main board here is divided into five regions, mm -hmm. four of which are gonna be gates. Which, which are variations simple, of color. Variations of color that are gonna determine what resources you get based mm -hmm. off the meeples and the color of gate you have here, along with any cards you have. And we'll get into how those cards work when we dive into actually placing at a gate. Mm -hmm. The other zone, the fountain zone here, is going to be where you go to purchase cards. That's how you grow your engine over here and start kind of chaining effects. And they also let you upgrade your cards once you have that ability as well. So after I decide to place this meeple down, I'll resolve the effect of that location. 
And then I'll collect one meeple from this middle fountain area based off of what's here and add it back into my bag. Yep leaving you with exactly four meeples in your bag and continuing on to the next player's turn. Mm -hmm. Now, play will continue like this until end game scoring, or until we meet that end game condition. And I think that's a good segue into actually talking about a little bit about these cards. So every time you get a card, you're gonna have a front facing and a back facing. Whenever you're able to develop a card, which is essentially flip, it's gonna be developed. So that trigger is actually gonna happen depending on player count of how many cards are developed up from a single player. Yeah, so in so, a two player game, mm -hmm. I believe it's eight total developed yep. cards. Now, we will get into what the iconography means and how you actually purchase and develop the cards in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But, so that you know with end game scoring, Eight of these cards being flipped in a two-player game, seven in a three, and six in a four mm -hmm. will be what triggers the end of the game. Yeah. Now, victory points, before we get into the nuance, how do you actually score in this So game? there's four major ways. Okay. Um, essentially, by collecting gray cards, everything that's going to be at the bottom is an immediate victory point. There's kind of a sunburst or, uh, mm -hmm. or symbol down there that indicate. Then we also have our influence track. So the farther up you get your gray piece, that's how many points you're gonna get. And an important note, this is not cumulative. So yep. wherever your gray piece is by the end is what you're gonna get. Yep. The next thing that we're gonna do is purple cards. Purple cards are actually victory condition cards. End game scoring, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a very simple indication here would be we have a green resource worth one point. Yep. So on this card, if I had this in my tableau, I had not currently upgraded it, then at the end game, every green resource I have is worth exactly one, one victory point. point. Mm -hmm. And the final thing is actually going to be conditional. So whoever triggers the end of the game is going to get that one little token that we mentioned in the center of the fountain. Yep. What this means is that every single coin that that player collected is going to be worth one point. However, everybody else doesn't get to score it. Yeah, and the interesting thing is to develop their cards, they'll likely be paying either heavy resources or heavy coins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of that push-pull mechanic. How much do you want to stockpile versus when do you want to trigger that end game and go ahead and score those points? Yeah, and that's a, that's a good, I think that's another good opportunity to talk a little bit about resources and what you're doing in the minutia of the game. Let's go ahead and talk about what happens when you go to one of these mm -hmm. gates. So if I play my yellow meeple down here at this red gate location, Let's resolve this. I would first come over here to check if I had any cards that give me a resource bonus based on this. Mm -hmm. Currently, I do not. Right now, my player board indicates that if I play a blue meeple at a blue gate, I will gain one additional blue resource. However, if I had purchased this card, already had it in my tableau, it shows that I can play any color meeple, mm -hmm. red, blue, green, or yellow, at a red gate to gain one additional yep. red resource. So let's pretend like I had that. Go ahead and buff me by one. Mm -hmm. After that, I will check the middle of this gate here. I'll look for each individual color, gaining one resource per color. Yep. So one yellow, one red because of the gate itself, mm -hmm. and then one blue because of the additional yep. meeple. Perfect. From that point on, I've collected my resources. I then move out here to the center area. I will take one of these meeples, add it back into my bag, and That's move on it. to the next player's turn. Yep. Now, moving to your turn. Mm -hmm. There are some other things that can happen at gates. Let's go ahead and trigger one of those events. Yeah, so for example, right now I have a red meeple at the blue gate. So if I were to place another red meeple there, I would go through all the same steps that Jesse did. I would look at my board. I don't have anything that I could build off of. Then I will look at the board. I see I have two red meeples, so I gain two red resources. And I have one blue gate. Yep. Now, usually, as Jesse said, we would go to the center of the board and pick a color. However, in this case, at the very end of my gate action, because there are two meeples of the same color, they're actually going to go into that fountain space. Yeah, and then you get to select from that pool mm -hmm. to bring back into your bag. So I could potentially just take another red, Yeah, right? You can never have more than one colored meeple at the end of your turn at a single gate location. Yep. Now, the last thing that we have to indicate, whenever you start adding these golden meeples, if they get pushed from your board or you take one of these cards, mm -hmm. they'll immediately go into the fountain location. Yep. They can then be added and put into your bag. Mm -hmm. Golden meeples have their own unique effect here at the gate. Yeah. Again, some cards work with them. You'll see with a little golden meeple sign like this card right here, mm -hmm. indicating that if I went here to a red or yellow gate, I would gain one additional coin, okay? But if I play this golden meeple down here at the red location, let's say it was my turn again, I would go through the same scoring effects, mm -hmm. checking to see if I had any bonuses like this card would give me, mm -hmm. then gaining my then gaining my resources, one yellow for that yellow meeple, one blue for that blue meeple, one red for the red gate, 
nothing right now for my golden meeple. However, the meeple is going to allow you to do something very special. Out of the four tracks, you're gonna be able to choose whatever color or gate you're already at, and you're gonna be able to convert whatever you have there directly into gold pieces. Yeah, so here at the red gate, I would be able to convert my three red resources into gold mm -hmm. if I wanted. Now, an important thing to keep note of, when you convert, you must convert all of the resources yeah. you're able to up to a maximum of 12. You're never able to have more than 12 coin. Mm -hmm. That's kind of your hand limit. Along with that, something to consider. At the end here of each of these scoring tracks, we have the number six. Six is the limit of the amount of resources you can have, but it also, every time you hit that number, gives you a special bonus. And those bonuses are actually pretty straightforward. You're gonna be able to do one or two things. You're either going to be able to take your gray token and push it up your track one space additional for every time coin, you- mm -hmm. Additional coin and unlock golden meeple or increasing your kind of hand limit or property limit. Or, you can just go ahead and flip one of the cards in your tableau. Yeah, so this is gonna be one of the two ways that you can actually upgrade your cards. Mm -hmm. By getting a resource to the end of the track here, you can flip it without paying that additional upgrade cost. Let's go ahead and go into the fountain here yep. where we'll talk about buying these cards and talk about paying the upgrade cost to actually develop them. So it works the exact same way. You'll draw a meeple from your bag and now you'll place that meeple in that center. Once you go into that center, you have to choose a side out of the four that are available. When you decide that, you can spend as many resources as you like to purchase as many cards as you can. Keeping in mind your property limit. Correct, and that's very important. So you'll notice here in your player board, you have some numbers, you have some numbers kind of like inside of a card shape. So we have a three, five, mm -hmm. eight, and a nine plus, meaning once you're past this nine plus, you can have as many properties as you'd like. That is one of the main incentives of why you wanna kind of like stockpile on certain resources so you can slowly increase sure. your capacity and your tableau building as the game goes through. However, with that being said, um, you're still gonna be able to purchase those cards to your limit. And once you've purchased, you can now develop as many cards as you like. How do you purchase and what are the values? So yeah. at the top of every card, you're gonna have a small little banner that contains symbols. Those symbols you'll notice are the exact same ones you have on your player board. Essentially, if I wanted to purchase this card, I would need to spend two yellow resources and one red resource. Yep. And I would take that card into my tableau and that is now permanently there. If I, perchance, had more some more resources, two yellow and a red, I can in that same turn develop that card. Yeah, so the develop action is fairly simple. You're just paying that market cost twice for that property. Mm -hmm. So the cards that we already had on our player board here, we'd pay that once, two blue in my case, to go ahead and flip and gain the kind of advanced action. Mm -hmm. Or, for instance, here, we have three coin to gain this purple card. If I paid three coin, it would come over here. If I pay three more coins, so a total of six, I'd flip that over and I'd have a higher victory point. Yeah. In this case, this green pot would actually be worth two instead of one. And an important note about resources in general. So every single player board has a specialty. Mm -hmm. And those specialties are going to be determined, like we said, right here in the lower right-hand corner, which gives you that specific property card. Here's the rub. If you're ever able to move your token all the way to the end of your influence track, now every resource of that particular color that you specialize in Yellow is actually a wild. Yellow for you, mm -hmm. blue for me. Yep. Yeah, they it's become now wild, they can be used for uh, kind of anything throughout the course of the game. And speaking of wild, coin can actually be used as wild as well. Mm -hmm. So if I have these three coin, and we're just kinda, I'm just stealing cards at this point, but if I have these three coin and I had, let's say, two yellow here, and I wanted to purchase this card. I could in fact purchase it even though I don't have the red necessary. I'd just pay one coin per mm -hmm. additional resource that I need to use. So I'd spend those two yellow, pull that over, pay that coin for the red. And that's a good move because remember, at the end of the game, only one person is gonna score those coins. Sure. So you have to be, you need to calculate when exactly you spend that money and if you're ever even going to need to kind of like stockpile that up. There's a ton of different strategies here. Yeah, there's a lot of different routes you can go. You can try to lean into your purple cards. You could really try to get your resources up and kind of maximize some of your end game scoring. You could build yourself up this track because 18 points at the end of the game, it's a lot. It's a lot of points, mm -hmm. yeah. Or you could try to be as kind of property hungry as possible, scoring those bottom points, which are smaller numbers, potentially can pile up to kind of be yeah. a big sum by the end of the game. 
I really do enjoy how this plays. Like, we both have been squabbling over who's going to take the prototype home. <laughs> me. It's going to be me. We'll see. We'll see. But that's that's the main structure. Like we said, there's a lot of different ways to get to that endgame scoring. But the core of the game, one more time for people that want a mm -hmm. brief refresher here at the end. You... You're going to be drawing a meeple from your bag, mm -hmm. placing that meeple either to get resources on one of these gates or into the fountain to purchase cards. Mm -hmm. Cards can be developed to trigger endgame scoring, progress you throughout the course of the game. Resources move you up your track, which then potentially help you upgrade cards or adjust your advancement token mm -hmm. down here at the bottom. At the end of resolving where you placed your meeple, you'll take one from the fountain, add it into your bag so that you always have four, four. total, mm -hmm. and play will progress until, in a two-player game, someone has advanced eight of these cards. Mm -hmm. Then you'll go through endgame scoring, scoring based off of four core functions. Which are your influence track, whatever points you've been able to accumulate through your cards, your purple cards, and finally, if you were able to gain the fountain token in the center, one point for every coin that you've been able to collect. Yeah, that's the core of Lions of Lydia. Yeah. Hopefully this has been a aggressively clear how to play. Like, I think we repeated <laughs> things two or three times. That's sort of what we do. We try yeah. to make these as conversational as we can. We, Maybe we were really concise with this one, I think. Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Until I get to the edit bay and realize that this is a 20-minute video <laughs> on how to play Lions of Lydia. The reality is we teach each other games in a conversational manner, asking mm -hmm. questions, diving back and forth. So, the approach we, so that's the approach we've tried to take here on Quackalope. If you've enjoyed our approach, please remember to subscribe down below, leave a comment letting us know what your thoughts are around this game, if you've had a chance to try it out or if you're excited to do so. I know MVM and a few other companies, this was on like mm -hmm. one of their most anticipated games oh, yeah. of 2020 list. Mm -hmm. So we were excited to get an advanced look at it. Thank you for being here though. And whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Thank you.